Thank you, and once again, good morning to students and teachers of the Word of God. On today's broadcast, we're dealing with the most important subject in Christology, perhaps the most important subject of all, the matters of the death of Christ. The death of Christ cannot be sub uh, discussed in systematic theology or dogmatic theology, apart from another important subject, soteriology, which, of course, deals with the doctrines of salvation. And the two doctrines that are most opposed by the unregenerate hell-bound sinner are the Bible doctrines of the Incarnation and the Bible doctrines of expiation, that is, blood atonement. These two doctrines show the marvelous, inconceivable, infinite love of God to poor, sinful humanity, and nothing is resisted stronger by unsaved fallen men than the great two doctrines that deal with the Incarnation, that is, God manifest in the flesh, coming to help sinners, and the other doctrine, which is the doctrine of the substitutionary blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ dying in the place of the sinner. Substitution is the great doctrine of Peter, Paul, James, and even Philip in the book of Acts. Dwight L. Moody said, there is not a ray of hope for man outside of substitution. Now, I may be talking to somebody who says, well, I don't believe in the doctrine of substitution. But uh, the truth of the matter is, you do. I mean, the truth of the matter is that although you may pretend you don't believe in the doctrine of substitution, uh, some of you people I'm talking to are working yourselves to the grave, an early grave, to bring up support for a family, and some of you have gone overseas and uh, endangered your life in Vietnam because somebody had to go and you went in their place. Anybody with an ounce of sense should understand substitution. Death was the supreme work of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth, and he came here to live and die in the place of somebody else. His purpose could be gained in no other way. Sin involves the death penalty. The Bible said the wage of sin is death. Somebody had to bear it. Either the sinner has to bear it, or a substitute has to bear it, and nothing is clearer than this from the Word of God. You, my friend, are either going to die in your sins and bear your sins in the presence of a holy God against whom you have sinned, and then bear the payment, the amount of time prescribed by a God who lives forever, or your sins are going to be borne into the presence of God by a substitute dying in your place who paid the penalty for you, one or the other. And there's no possibility of bribery here at heaven's court. You're not going to buy off the judge or delay the time or litigate or fail to keep your day. The blood atonement is the heart of Christianity. C.H. Spurgeon chose a text, and then he said, After I choose a text, I make a beeline for Calvary. When one of the great preachers out in Texas died, he told his successor, Lash the seminary to the cross. The red line of blood passes right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now, in regards to Christ's death, in the first place, it was foretold by God. In the second place, his death was appointed by God. It was foretold by God in Isaiah 53, 8. He was cut off from the land of the living. Daniel spoke of it when he said, After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Zechariah spoke of it when he said, Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. This is the death prophesied in the Old Testament, and prophesied by uh, the Old Testament, and prophesied years and years and years before the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, even down to the last detail. In Psalm 22, we read that he did have his hands and feet pierced. In Psalm 22, we read that there be lots cast for his garments. In Psalm 22, verse 1, we read what he would cry on the cross. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, we learn that he be whipped with stripes. His death was appointed by God. Isaiah said, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 10 said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Simon Peter said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now this death is called an atonement. This word atonement is used 77 times in the Bible, meaning a covering for sin. It is an Old Testament word. It is also called not only an atonement, but a propitiation. This carries the thought of uh, the Lord being satisfied for the offering. First John 2.2 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins. This death of Jesus Christ is spoken of as a substitution. The innocent takes the punishment of the guilty. It was the Lord Jesus Christ himself who said in John 10, verse 11, 
the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This death of the Lord Jesus Christ is also spoken of as redemption. The sinner is in bondage, he is brought back to God with a certain purchase price. Simon Peter said, You are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The death of Christ is not only spoken of as an atonement, a propitiation, a substitution, and redemption, but a reconciliation. God and man were enemies. They can now be made friends. Paul says, If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. That is, no, the death of Christ is also spoken of as a ransom. In Matthew 20:28, 20, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life as a ransom for many. Now, do you know what the most important thing about this passage is? It's to notice that in every place where the Bible speaks of the death, about the death of Christ for sinners, it is very careful never to mention water baptism. Water baptism is only found connected with the word saved one time in Mark 16, and the word saved can mean saved from deception, 1 Timothy, your ministry saved from falling apart, 1 Timothy, and also being saved from drowning, Acts 27. Some people kind of overdo the word saved. Now, you understand when I ask you if you're saved, I mean you're saved from hell. But water baptism is never connected with atonement, propitiation, substitution, redemption, regeneration, eternal life, reconciliation, or the ransom. These things have to do with eternal salvation. They have nothing to do with Simon Peter's Pentecostal message where he tells the Jews and Jewish proselytes at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. It had nothing to do with that at all. As a matter of fact, when Peter gets the advanced revelation in Acts chapter 10, he never makes the mistake of preaching that thing again in his life. That message was perfectly all right in Acts chapter 2, before Paul was saved, before there was any New Testament, before the gospel of the grace of God was revealed, before Matthew, Mark, Luke had written anything, and that was a proper message for circumcised, pork-abstaining, Sabbath-observing, temple-worshipping Jews. It certainly had nothing to do with the substitutionary blood atonement of Jesus Christ for sinners, as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 2, you can't find one mention of Jesus Christ dying for anybody's sins. You find his death, burial, and resurrection, but not his atonement, propitiation, substitution, reconciliation, ransom, or redemption. Now, it's a later revelation. Now, in regard to the death of Christ, of course, he died by crucifixion. This is apparent. It was prefigured to be on a pole, lifted up, as in Numbers 28 or 21 8 and John 3 14. It was an ignominious death, not as a shameful death, a degrading death. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 said, He endured the cross, despising the shame, undoubtedly crucified naked. Although the pictures show him with clothes on, which I certainly would show when I draw the pictures for the sake of decency, but the scriptural facts would indicate naked. It was an accursed death, according to Galatians 3.13, where we read, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Nor are you to be deceived for a minute by the ancient uh, Rutherford and Russellite teaching that he wasn't crucified on a cross, but crucified on a stake. That's some more of that nonsense here from time to time. The Romans put him up on crosses. Now, the Assyrians staked him out, but after all, Christ wasn't crucified by the Assyrians. He was crucified by the Romans. Get your Bible straight, never mind the clinkers from the Greek originals. His death was voluntary. Jesus Christ volunteered to die for us, and he was not forced to do it. In John 10, 18, he said, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down by myself. Why? What was the reason for this? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless one, die? He didn't have to die. His death is called a contradiction of sinners against himself in Hebrews chapter 12. You can understand how a guilty person would have to die as a result of sin, but here's a sinless man who lays down his life to satisfy the justice of a holy God in heaven, and he pays that payment in full. You see, all the attributes of God must be in harmony to make salvation possible. He must not only be justifier of him that believeth in Jesus, but also just. God had a problem to speak reverently. 
his problem with how to be the holy, righteous, and just God that he is, that a modernist doesn't think he is, and at the same time forgive and be merciful to a sinful wretch who rebels against him, which he does. That's the problem. The way the liberal or modernist gets around that is he just pretends there isn't any problem. He just pretends that a God is just so good and honey-wunny and ducky-wucky and lovey-wovey and icely-nicey and nicey-wicey that he just forgive anybody anything just for the chance to forgive them. Baloney. That isn't a Bible doctrine. That isn't a New Testament doctrine. You never found that anywhere except in the modern slop sung on radio and television by these half-baked sheep who've just been saved and think this qualifies them to be shepherds and lead the flock. You'll never find anything in that Bible where God forgave anybody anything apart from the blood atonement. I said, you'll never find anywhere in that Bible where God forgave anybody anything apart from a blood atonement. You know what happened to David when he got forgiven for his sin with, with uh, Bathsheba? The Lord killed the baby boy. You know what happened when God forgave Adam and Eve? He told them with the skins of an animal that shed blood in the grass. You know what happened before God accepted Abel's sacrifice? The blood of that sheep ran out in that altar. You know why God forgave all those Jews their idolatry and perverse us down in Egypt? Because they put the blood of the Lamb on the outside of the door. You're living in a fool's paradise if you think that the God of this universe ever forgave any man anything without a proper, holy, just, and righteous basis on which to do it. And if your God forgave you without a holy, just, and righteous base to do it, your God is unjust, unholy, and unrighteous. Your God is what the Bible calls the God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Now, there are many objections to the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The self-righteous fool will say, cannot a man pay for his own sins? Yes, but the full penalty is eternal death, and eternity will not be long enough to pay the complete debt because God lives forever. The self-righteous sacramentalist thinks, cannot a man atone for his own sins? Well, you could if you burn forever in hell. That'd be a payment. Do you want to do that? The Bible said almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Only death can satisfy the demands of God, and the soul never succeeds in dying in hell. Someone who's defined hell as dying forever and never being able to die. That is, when you sin against an eternal being, don't you understand it requires an eternal payment? A man said, why, God wouldn't send a man to hell for a few little sins like adultery, you know, and thieving and exaggerating, overeating and being impatient and lying. Well, that depends upon whom you sin against. You realize when you reject Jesus Christ, you're guilty of high treason. You've rebelled against the government of the universe, grand larceny. You've stolen the most valuable possession there is, life. You've stolen a life that isn't yours, that God gave you to live for yourself. And deicide, your sins, if Christ was God manifest in the flesh, your sins murdered him. That's what Peter called the Sanhedrin, murders. That's what Stephen called the Sanhedrin, murders. You think high treason, grand larceny, and deicide are not, not enough to fix a man? You shall not burn in hell forever. Well, let me ask you this, friend. How long does God live? One more time with feeling. Can't you kill a man in two seconds with a trigger of a gun? How long will you pay for it? Two seconds if the law catches you? Give you your brain for anything beside a pillow? Now listen. Old Job said if a man sinned against God, who can justify him? If you sin against a being that lives forever, your payment is going to be forever. Now, you can do it yourself. That's the modern way of handling things. Or you can accept what God did for you. There are only two religions, do and done. 
You're either trying to get to heaven by your self-effort, your, your self-efforts, your sacrament, your religion, your church, your golden rule, Acts 238, and all your scriptural baloney, or you're resting upon what Christ did to save you. The Lord Jesus Christ died for sinners, and Paul didn't invent this doctrine at all. Jesus himself began to show his disciples in Matthew 16, 21, how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and be raised again. And he said, Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, will this doctrine of a substitution make men feel hopeless and, and sin even more? No. The cross teaches God's great hatred for sin, and when a man comes into the blood substitutionary atonement of a sinless Savior dying in his place, it inspires him to love God and serve the Savior, not sin. The people are always worrying about one saved, always saved, and always worried about losing it. Those are the people who have never been born again, so naturally they want to sin, and they think the more freedom they have, the more they would sin, because they've got the thing fixed down where Christ didn't pay it all. They're paying some of it themselves. And this is why all these people who are worried about losing salvation are so upset about the doctrine of eternal security, always say, well, if I believe that, well, I just said, I'll buy live like a devil. Listen, stupid, if you don't believe it, how would you know what you'd do? Nothing funnier than a man arguing about eternal security who doesn't have it. Nothing more ridiculous or ludicrous than a man going around saying, why, if I believe that, I want to save, always save, I could just want to live like a devil. Well, son, since you've never been saved, what's the point in discussing it? This world is filled with unsaved people trying to work their way to heaven, talking about what they think about the doctrine of eternal security. Well, after all, after all, what you think really doesn't amount to anything anyway, does it? I mean, if you don't know that you're in Christ and know that you're saved and know you're going to heaven, why discuss it? Why discuss drag racing or something edifying? Each of us today could volunteer to suffer for a prison, for a prisoner, and go in his place. You understand the substitution. Each of us, if a firing squad was drawn up and uh, decided to kill ten men in a city because of uh, sabotage against the army's occupation, any man could step forward and take any man's place in the ranks. You could volunteer to die for somebody else. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This isn't the case of somebody who's kin to somebody dying in their place. This isn't the case where somebody volunteers to die for somebody as an act of bravery or to earn their salvation by good works. This is a case where a pure, spotless, sinless man who never had an evil thought in his life comes down and takes the place of a dirty, self-righteous, proud, sex-crazy, money-mad, demon-possessed, unregenerate, hell-bound, blaspheming sinner and loves him enough to die in his place and bear his sins. Do you have any friend who loves you that much? People say, well, couldn't God just forgive the sinner without the death in Calvary? Sin has been committed against God. God couldn't, for the law of God must be satisfied. God's not a liar. The same God who said, I love, I forgive, I'll have mercy, said, Thou shalt not bear false witness. What you going to do, make a liar out of God? Decide, well, that law didn't mean anything. Paul said the law is spiritual and just and good. He said it was the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Are you going to say because God is loving and kind and affectionate that he just undo what he said and just pretend he didn't say it? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Happy spoken, and shall he not do it? Or happy said it, and shall he not make it good? Yes, he certainly will. In Genesis 2.17, the Lord said, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You think he was kidding? You won't at the next funeral. In Ezekiel 18.4, he said, The soul that sinneth it shall die. You don't believe it? You will at the white throne judge and your kinfolk go into hell. In Romans 6.23, he said, The wage of sin is death. You think he'll just forgive you and just not let you die? On what grounds? On the base of what? Your goodness? Are you trying to be funny? 
Not even repentance removes the need for punishment of sin. Sin has been committed. Sin must be dealt with according to God's precepts. The justice and honor of God are at stake, and God Almighty will preserve them. He said, My glory I'll not give to another. The holiness of God demands the death penalty for sin, and the only people who don't believe in that are people that have an unholy God. And you people who don't believe in hell, fire, and damnation, which is the expression used by Jesus Christ in Matthew 23 and Matthew 5, and you people who don't believe in the holy God who will punish sin, you are living in cloud land, and you're taking an excursion into Disneyland theologically, and your awakening is going to be horrible, tragic, dramatic, hideous, and appalling. If there's any God up there, he's sinless. If there's any God up there, he's holy. If there's any God up there, he will deal with sin, and if he said he'll deal with sin, he'll deal with it. That book said, Be sure your sin will find you out. That Bible said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. I know some of you people don't like that, but you don't have the sense that God gave a brass monkey anyway, so why waste time with you? You don't find Jesus Christ wasting five minutes with that rich, cultured, educated crowd that thought they were smarter than God. He spent half a morning talking to a fallen woman and spent time in his life dealing with a demon-possessed sinner and blind Bartimaeus, but that crowd that didn't think God would punish sin, that crowd that said, what is truth, and then turned around and walked out, he wouldn't waste five minutes with them. Some of you people have been brainwashed by the news media and the pulp magazines for so long, you don't think God will let a sinner burn in hell. Boy, have you got a revelation coming. Some of you people have been listening to liberal and modernistic preachers for so long, you think hell is air-conditioned or been redecorated or renovated. And the reason why your preacher air-conditioned hell is because he was getting it ready so he could move in. There isn't one verse in that Bible from cover to cover that ever leads you to believe that God wouldn't let a Christ-rejecting, Christ-denying sinner burn forever for his sin of paying his righteousness against the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 3. You said, Brother Ruckman, are you telling me the best I can do is no good? Exactly. You said, Dr. Ruckman, are you telling us in this theological seminar that if we do the best we can, we'll go to hell? This is sure as you're breathing. Unless you receive Jesus Christ. And that's the best you can do. But you don't think that, do you? When I just said that, you didn't have in mind receiving God's Son. You had in mind joining a church and getting back, uh, baptized and taking the sacraments and keeping the golden rule, didn't you? Well, if you're a blind man following a blind man, Christ said you both fall in the ditch. Every man and woman listening to my voice who's counting on their righteousness to save them have pitted their righteousness against the righteousness of God. You know what you said? Now, you haven't said this openly and publicly. You wouldn't have the nerve. You know what you said? You don't have enough guts to say it, so I'll say it for you. You know what you said to God? You said to God, I know that book says that Christ is your righteousness. I know that Christ is the end of the law of righteousness, everyone that believeth. But personally, I think that prayer and good deeds can make me just as good as Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Ruckman, I don't say that, but why don't you take him as your Savior? People say, is it not impossible to transfer guilt from a guilty one to an innocent one? Human courts punish only the guilty one, but they could punish a substitute if such were desired, for the substitute voluntarily assumes the guilt of the other. Haven't some of you men gone downtown and paid a traffic ticket for your wife? How is it you do not understand me? Why do you not understand my speech? You men I'm talking to have gone down and paid a, a ticket traffic for your wife, haven't you? You've been the innocent one paying for the guilty. Haven't you done that? Doesn't that Bible said, husband, you'll love your wives enough to die for them? Do you think there was a mother when Herod killed all the babies that didn't throw her body across the body of that helpless two-year-old baby and try to get that sword to stab her instead of the baby? You understand what I'm talking about. You understand what Isaiah meant when he said, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
Simon Peter said his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. People say, well, if each sin required eternal death, how could Christ suffer an innumerable number of deaths in the few short hours of Calvary? Well, that's easy. He was God manifest in the flesh. And with God, there is no time. No problem. If he was God manifest in the flesh, time with him and eternity are the same thing. God dwells in eternity. And when Christ made that payment for sin in Calvary's cross, that payment extended from before Genesis 1-1 to after Revelation 22. You see how do we know that? Because we know when we get in Christ, we have eternal life. Didn't you read in Romans chapter 6, where when the Holy Spirit puts a man to the Jesus Christ, that that man becomes partaker of not only Christ's life, but partaker of his death and burial? Didn't you read that? Didn't you read Paul said, I am, present tense, crucified with Christ? I know the new Bible say I have been in order to overthrow the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, but we're not dealing with these new pulp magazines and trash. We're dealing with the Word of God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, present tense. At this minute I'm talking to you, I'm not only risen to walk a newness of life, but my old man is nailed to the cross and is hanging there. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was not the amount of suffering that counted, but the justice of God that took place at Calvary. And the one who suffered was not a mere man like you or I. He was the God-man. 1 Timothy 2.5 His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That verse in Isaiah 52.14 suggests a death so horrible that God pulled down the curtain of darkness at Calvary to cover a marred face, bruised, beaten, battered, torn. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who causes pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing grace, how can it be that thou, my God, should find out me? He left his Father's home above, so free, so infinite was his grace, and emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race, Amazing grace, how can it be? For, oh, my God, it found out me. Has it found out you? It was love that sent the Savior to the world of sin and woe. It was love that sent, uh, love that sent God's gift from heaven's portals down to earth below. Do you know anything about that love? It was love. Love so sublime, love so divine, love that is deeper than any sea, love for us all. Oh, how can it be? The death of Jesus Christ is God's provision for the sinner. Are you a sinner? God has made a wonderful provision for you. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide in life, God will provide in death, and above all, God will provide his righteousness for you at the judgment. So when you stand there, you don't stand in the filthy trappings of church membership, baptism, sacraments, golden rule, and scriptural alibis, but stand there in the righteousness of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you, and good day.